you know, if you're looking for an American hero, uh, you know, this is somebody who really had a chance to, to make that choice and lived it. And, uh, you know, I would argue she was under the most pressure of anybody in that swimming community at Athens, even Michael Phelps. Uh, we see in the book that different people react to pressure differently. Uh, there's one swimmer in particular who uh, behaves so deplorably that uh, you know, Natalie almost escorted her from Athens herself. Uh, but uh, the pressure she was under was this. We are told that there is one way to become a great competitive swimmer, and that way is pound, 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 pound. Uh, she and Terry had come up with a different way that is virtually, uh, you know, uncopied at this point. And it is a holistic approach. It is technique over volume. It is variety. It, is, it involves Pilates and land work and uh, the revolutionary concept that sometimes you should just, you know, go surf for a couple of days and stay out of the pool. And uh, yet this is a sport that she once again loves. You know, and it, it is an incredible sport. And you, you know that when people read this book in the established swimming community, they're going to freak out because they believe there's only one way to do it. And I think what I admire her most for is that uh, she believes that whatever flack she gets right now, that the young swimmers here, like uh, a couple of my friends here and uh, some of you, will, will benefit. That you can love this sport and approach it a variety of ways and not have coaches who tell you it's got to be this way because this is how Mark Spitz did it in 1972 and this is the way we're going to do it. Maybe that worked for Mark Spitz, maybe it'll work for some kids, but uh, there is a different way. And uh, anyway, I'm just, uh, I, I've done books with Dennis Rodman, Jerry Rice, Kurt Warner. Uh, this is by far my favorite uh, person to work with and uh, it's my favorite book. And thank you so much for coming out. Appreciate it. And if you guys have any questions for either of us, uh, fire away. Which had never been done before, so commend for that. But what what was it that finally went? Mm, I'm going to go backstroke freestyle. Mm -hmm. Well, um, for the Olympics, what it was was you know I was a world record holder in the hundred backstroke, and that was definitely an event that I wasn't going to pass up. I loved that event, um, so that was an easy choice. From there is basically a choice between the, um, oh, and the 200 free, unfortunately, was the same day as Hunter Back with the semifinal format and everything, so that was out of the question. Um, and then, so it was a choice between the 200 back and the uh, 100 free, and just going into the Olympics, knowing that the Australians are swimming so fast in the 100 free, knowing that, you know, the 100 free is quickly becoming one of my favorite events, um, I wanted to be a part of that final, because um, leading up to the Olympics, uh, six, the top six, six, or the six fastest competitors ever were going to be going to the Olympics um, in that event, and I really wanted to be a part of that. Um, so that was exciting to me. And for so long, you know, I was a distance swimmer growing up, and every distance swimmer's dream is to become a sprinter. And I was just, you know, and it's, it's funny now because um, people like can't believe that I used to do distance. <laughs> Uh, so, people think I'm a sprinter now. Um, but yeah, the 100 fly and 100 back overlapped as well um, with the semi final. There, there was a lot of pressure on her to swim the 200 back instead of the 100 free. Uh, the 200 back is considered a very weak event internationally. Uh, her coach, Terry McKeever, who was uh, you know, very wise about these things felt like it would be a great thing for Natalie to go out, you know, maybe set a world record, certainly have an easier path to gold. And uh, it was fun watching the push and pull uh, between Terry and Natalie because Natalie, uh, you know, I, I think the, the uh, uh, technical, technical explanation for your view of the turn back would be that you should. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, she loves the header free. It's the glamour event of uh, swimming. And, 
she she didn't shy away from the challenge. So uh, I I'll never forget at uh, the meet uh, before the Olympic trials, the uh, Janet Evans meet at, in Long Beach at the same pool. The look on her face when she finally. She withdrew from that evening's 200 back, and she was going to still swim the 100 free, which basically sealed the deal. And you know, she was in the best mood I'd seen in months. So, uh, but she went with her heart, and she also, you know, defied, uh, you know, the logic and, and made the calls. Mm -hmm. Haven't made a lot of friends from the super meets. Yeah, um, well, obviously I've made many friends at Cal, just going going there and my college friends. And it's just such an interesting time because you live with these people, you train with these people, you go to school with these people. And um, sometimes you get sick of each other, you know, like you would your brothers or sisters, but um, you, you establish a really close relationship. Um, and then also, kind of the same thing goes for these travel meets. Uh, when you go to the Olympics, uh, you, for swimming, uh, Olympic trials is six weeks before the Olympics, and as soon as Olympic trials are over, you go to a training camp uh, with all your competitors and all your teammates uh, that, that have also made the Olympic team. You live together, and you eat together, and uh, train together, and you're with each other for that whole six weeks, um, so you make a lot of really close friends. And um, It's a very stressful time, but it, it's also exciting. Um, and my roommate uh, was Lindsay Banco, who uh, uh, was also a member of the 800 free, free uh, relay, and um, she was team captain. And Jenny Thompson has become a really close friend of mine. Um, I was just in New York and visited her. She's finishing up uh, medical school, so you, you make you make a lot of contacts throughout your career, um, which hopefully I'll uh, keep in touch with all these people. What's that for Jenny? 11 medals and a medical degree? Yeah, like I think 12 medals. That's <laughs> pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> Would you like to be a breaststroker? What do you do now? I was always everything but a breaststroker, basically. Um, it always switched up. Uh, when I was really young, I was a butterfly and backstroker. Um, and then, uh, you know, became kind of an I am -er when. But a little like 12 or so, and then I became a distance freestyler and uh, 400 diameter, and then as a fluke uh, at one nationals, we, I was supposed to be doing my off events. Um, my club coach and I decided that we were going to do our off events, and that was the first time I did the turner back ever at nationals, and um, I ended up winning it, <laughs> which was so, it was my first win, so that's how I became a backstroker again. Um, so. It, it, it's always changed, but just never frustrated. Uh, two questions. One is, what's the moment like when you're up on the starting block? You know, what does it feel like to be in your final race against all these amazing world-class swimmers? Do you have a certain routine you go through, a certain meditation, or a focus, or... Well, my routine is pretty much the same. Uh, first, I, I need my coffee. <laughs> um, and I don't have a little too much today. I'm a little shaky. But um, I, I like to have my coffee. It's like kind of my, you know, um, comfort, uh, comfort in the cup. And then I have this whole Pilates routine uh, that my Pilates instructor and I come up with, uh, mainly because I get so cold when I warm up that I have to do a lot. Um, I have to get myself ready before I even get in the water. And then I do my uh, routine in the water and um, get out of the pool about a half hour before my race and just try and keep warm and just stay calm and listen to music and just be relaxed. Um, and before uh, the 100 bat uh, final at the Olympics, it's such, it's such an interesting time because, you know, leading up into the Olympics, I, I was one of the, like, the faces of NBC. You know, I did those commercials, those behind the scene commercials, and you have so much sponsor pressure going on and all these other things and you're trying not to think about it but you, you still do. <laughs> so it, it was uh, the hunter back was was very or at the Olympics was very different because I just had all these things in the back of my mind. But in general I just I just try and stay calm and it's really hard to get the Olympics but I manage it. <laughs> so the other question if you don't mind is yeah. it seems like from what you said uh, Michael that 
is, the, is one purpose of the book to show that there is another way to train? And, you know, having been a parent of a swimmer for more than 10 years, you know, there's a certain way that they train. Yeah. But it seems like what you're saying is another way to do it. Yeah, I think absolutely, and yeah. I, don't, I don't know that Natalie's saying that every club coach in the country should now drastically change his or her approach, but there are things that really a parent who has a kid in any sport will recognize from the, you know, competitive club experience that, you know, are some of the pitfalls you want to avoid as a parent, um, and certainly as, a, as you grow up and become a young adult, um, you know, things you want to look for, and then... Yeah, but certainly, I think she just wants to get people thinking about uh, other things. This approach is treated as a given. It's the antithesis of science. You know, in science, we say you have to prove that something uh, is viable before you treat it as so. This is almost the opposite. They say, well, this is the way we do it, and if you can't disprove it, then uh, you know we're just going to assume it's that way. I think it's finally been disproven uh, on, on a grand stage, and uh, yeah, hopefully it'll change things. I think what's so important um, to understand is that there are just many different ways to be successful, and I think it's really important for um, kids and coaches and just people in the sports community, not necessarily the swimming community, just to realize that there are so many different paths to success, and just to be really open-minded um, about you know, training philosophies, different techniques, um, you know, nutrition, uh, Pilates, like holistic approaches, uh, everything. Um, just really to be open and willing to try new things and experiment with, uh, you know, no, new philosophies. Um, you know, like this, this year, I'm really trying to do um, heavy, heavy weights. And I'm going to see how that works. Uh, yeah, I got the guns. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, haven't, I haven't really done that before. And... So it's all about just experimenting throughout your career and just seeing what works, seeing what doesn't, and um, just having fun along the way and not taking sports too seriously. And the great thing for her is that she's now freed up uh, to do this because she's proven that her way succeeds. That's why I think she was under more pressure than any LMB. Uh If she failed, this entire you know philosophy, you know everybody in the swimming community would say, "See." You know, she didn't train enough or whatever. And, uh, you know, it's such a happy ending. She comes through and now can push the envelope even further or experiment. Terry becomes the uh, first woman to serve on a U.S. Olympic swim coaching staff. And now will be the head coach at the Pan Pacific Games, uh, which is another first for a woman. And uh, recently made a really uh, good decision, which is shortly after leading Cal to a fourth place finish at the NCAAs with an improving team and some of the people in this book coming through huge. Uh, she had a chance to go back and coach her alma mater, USC. You know, you'll see in the book she has uh, the history of her family and USC athletics is, you know, she's steeped in USC lore. She's got family down there. It would have been a very logical decision in a lot of ways to, to go. And, uh, she recently decided that she's going to stay at Cal, so I think that pretty much means we get her for life. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. Um, with 2004 being the first year that you had a female Olympic coach, how do you think that will change the atmosphere as compared to having a male coach all the time? <coughs> for, for me, or well, just in general. Well, you know, it's interesting. The swimming community, there, or at least in the college swimming community, I can only name like five or six female head coaches, so it's definitely a sport where there are a lot of male head coaches for one reason or another, I have no idea why that is, but um, to have Terry succeed at the Olympics as a coach and to be one of the first is really exciting and hopefully just inspires, you know, more people or more females, you know, to, to become um, coaches and know that you can succeed in this um, as a female and you can be, you know, you, you can make it to the Olympics uh, as a coach as a female, so... Hopefully that helps. Yeah. Um, <coughs> music do you listen to? <laughs> Me? Yeah. Um, I listen to anything, basically, other than country, not big country, and, and uh, not really into the techno scene, but uh, pretty much everything else. Me too. Do you think you're successful having an impact on men's swimming also, or do you think you're First will be more um, I, I hope so because 
uh, one, of, like, one of the athletes that I really admire um, a lot uh, is actually Gary Hall uh, Jr. And, you know, people look at him, they're like, oh, he's crazy, he doesn't train, he's lazy, he's this, he's that. He is one of the most consistent competitors, and rather than looking at him as, um, you know, an exception to the rule, I think people maybe now with, uh, you know, my philosophy and, you know, Anthony Urban succeeding and um, Gary Hall and all these other people succeeding through um, unconventional methods, hopefully people, uh, men and, and women, will be more open to new philosophy. And Gary also spends a lot of time training at Cal uh, mm -hmm. under Mike Bottom, the assistant men's coach. And uh, one day, Nally and I were in the middle of a conversation, and we look up, and this is in the book, Gary Hall walks by. But it's Gary Hall with a handlebar mustache. Uh, yeah, Sharpie did. Uh, it's like the funniest, wackiest yeah. guy. But so, uh, yeah. Natalie, I'm a coach myself, and I can think of about 100 questions I'd like to ask, but um, yeah. can I pick just one that's a real nuts and bolts question, because I know there are many swimmers in the room, they might be interested. What's the best coaching tip you've ever gotten um, for going into a flip turn? Because I know a lot of people who have observed that you have, you have a good ability to do that. You don't want me to answer that one? <laughs> yeah. bend at the hips and bend at the legs and um, so what I always try and do is to really just like slinky over like be like one giant curve and help and have the water flip me rather than effort and muscle flip you, flip you the momentum of the turn will flip you if you're in a coil. Do you do you look up the wall? No. Not no, even your head's bit. always facing yeah. yeah you're always looking at the bottom of the pool. But you're, you're submerging into it.